Good morning, church. I am excited. The best thing about teaching is it forces you to really do a, a deeper study, which is a blessing for the, uh, the person who's speaking. Um, and uh, our prayer, I know this is probably the same for almost every speaker, is that our prayer is that the th things that we learn that God has taught us, we want to pass on and, and we would love you to have the same excitement that we have in studying this. Uh, we're continuing Esther. So good morning, as Colin, I, I'm, my name is Lee Williams, and I am one of the elders at Tinjin International Christian Fellowship. I am a father of two lovely children, Abigail and Brandon. Uh, both of them grew up in China and have since moved to America. One uh, is married, uh, and uh, the other is uh, third year in college this year. Most importantly, though, they both love the Lord. I have a lovely, energetic wife named Dawn, and I have two sausage dogs. Uh, I'm also a, a teacher at Tinjin International School, and I think the thing I am best at is wasting time. A little bit about me. Why do I tell you this? This is an example of an introduction. Uh, a setup. I could go on there and, and use that information to tell you a story about myself or my family and uh, whatnot. I just finished teaching two weeks of summer school, and in this summer school, I taught my fifth graders uh, narrative writing, or we reviewed narrative writing. Um, and a narrative is telling a story, whether it's true or not, is, is you're telling a story. And traditionally, the first paragraph is called the introduction, but um, I, uh, my students um, got it more when I told them it's actually the setup. You're not actually getting into the story yet at the beginning. You're just giving the setup, introducing your characters, your setting, um, and preparing the way for the rest of your story. And this is why I call my sermon today the setup, because that's what's going on. All of chapter one can be referred to as the setup. Today we're we're only specifically dealing with the second half of chapter one, but we'll do a little little review and we'll look a little bit at the historical setting. I, I really enjoy history and I got distracted a lot by the history of this time period. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, so the greater historical context and the big picture of what God is doing, and he's starting right here. Uh, this has ramifications for us even today, uh, and uh, I'll explain that later. So there are so many coincidences that happen in the story, um, in life, some, you know, it just so happened moments uh, that happen, and I think those are evidences of God's sovereignty that he's actively involved in, in, in life. Because I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God's providence. He is actively involved. And I think in the book of Esther, we get a clear picture of, of that. So, yes, I call this the setup. Uh, it is, uh, uh, the, what do you call it? a summary statement would be, God will use the king's pride and the queen's rebellion to set up the protection of his royal people through his servant, Esther. And that's what's happening here. Uh, and so the king that we're talking about is King Ahasuerus, King Xerxes. This is a picture of the movie 300. The movie 300 was about this time period. It's about what's going to be happening in history. It's, of course, they take massive poetic license and and they Hollywoodize the story. 300, if you know the story, is a story of the, the Greeks uh, and uh, how uh, a small group of 300 men held off the Persian army uh, in one particular battle. And uh, for us Americans, we might think of this as the, the, the Alamo. Um, and they, they eventually all died. But they held off the Greek, the Persian army, and they uh, did such a good job that eventually, through some more battles, the Persian army ended up retreating. 
and not conquering Greece. This is a more realistic picture of what he looked like. This was an artist's rendition taken from a relief that was found uh, uh, carved into a wall. Um, Xerxes is this bigger than life character. Uh, he, uh, he's known by many titles and this was, these were titles not just of Xerxes but of King Darius and King Cyrus the Great before him. Uh, they're called the Great King, the King of Persia, King of Babylon, Pharaoh of Egypt, King of Countries, and lastly, important, King of Kings. He was known as the King of Kings. Xerxes is a son of Darius who attacked, who attacked the Greeks, but got beat back and humiliated. Um, and then uh, in history, he was preparing to re-attack, um, but he died, he dies. And when Darius dies, Xerxes takes his place, or Ahasuerus, the guy we're talking about here. And as he t uh, rises to the kingship, um, Babylon and Egypt take that time as a time that, to rebel. And so Xerxes takes the next three, two, and a, two to three years quelling those rebellions, and he puts off the planned invasion of Greece. Uh, Xerxes is not only the son of Darius, he's also the grandson of Cyrus the Great. You might know that name. Cyrus the Great is the one that led Persia to defeat Babylon, and he's the one that signed the edict allowing the Israelites to return to, to uh, Israel. Now, not all the Jews went back to Israel. Some of them stayed here in, in Persia, uh, and among those were Mordecai and Esther, two of the, uh, the key people in our story. And that's how the book of Esther begins. That's where we are. The timeline in Esther opens up about 483 BC in chapter one with the army of Persia and Media and the nobles and the governors of the provinces coming together in the capital. Now, let me stop here and just say that one of my passions is to make the Bible real. People often have the Bible on one hand, history on the other hand, and they don't see the connection. And when you do make a connection, it's, it's like, wow, that's amazing. The Bible actually lines up with history. Well, yes, it does, because the Bible is history. The events in the Bible truly happen, and, and it's important that we understand that. So, um, let me quickly get myself back to my... So, if Xerxes throws this party and that lasts six months, and I always thought, wow, what a uh, six-month party. Well, actually what it was, was a strategic meeting of his, gov of his army uh, preparing for the invasion of Greece. So he had taken care of Babylon and, and Egypt. Now it's time to go back to the plans and invade Greece. So he has a six-month war strategy session. Uh, he's planning to make these final preparations for the invasion of Greece, which was ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, but he's going to make his plans. He's confident of his ability to knock off Greece, confident that his military forces, which are massive, are, are going to be triumphant. The battle of Persia versus Greece, the second Persian war, uh, was one of those all important turning points in history. In fact, there's a chance that if Persia had won this battle, democracy would have been set back hundreds and hundreds of years because uh, Greece was this burgeoning democracy, was the first real democracy uh, happening. So you see, it's, this is a key turning point in history and Esther is right there. So, super is this? Oh, this like I said, this time period is really interested. If you're if you're interested, look it up. Uh, I mean, something as simple as going YouTube and look up uh, search Greece versus Persia, 
or Xerxes versus Greece. Any of those, you'll get some, some really instructive uh, historical uh, explanations. So Xerxes ends this six-month summit of military planning uh, with a seven-day banquet or party. They're done with their planning. They're ready to invade. So you, you, you party. And this is where our story picks up. There's this party. And in verse 9, uh, Queen Vashti is also having a, a feast for the women in the palace that belong to Queen, I mean, King Ahasuerus. And maybe I'm too affected because of my British wife, but in my mind, I have this picture of these men having this rip-roaring party with alcohol and, you know, ev everything that a drunken party has. Um, some refer to it as an orgy. And the, queen, the queen's over here having tea with the ladies. That's, that's a picture in my mind. Like I said, it's probably too uh, affected by my British wife. So it's probably not a proper tea. But I'm sure the party for the women was, had a little more decorum than that of the men. Now verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, which means what? He was drunk, uh, been drinking for seven days, and, and he's, he's, he's toasted. He commands Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Kerkas, the seven eunuchs who served the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. So the king is drunk, and he's there with the leaders of all the realms, and they finish this planning session, and they're partying, they're celebrating. Perhaps this discussion arose about which realm has the most beautiful women. Perhaps the kings are saying, my, my, my wife is uh, more beautiful than your wife. Um, I don't know. You know, all we know is that King Xerxes uh, makes the ill-advised decision to call his queen to come, which he knows. If he was not drunk, he would, he would, he would know that this goes against Persian decorum. The queen, women, are not paraded before men in the Persian society. And even more so, the queen is rarely seen in public. And now the, uh, King Xerxes is commanding her to come and parade herself in front of all these drunken men. So perhaps uh, it's probably, you know, he, he's drunk, he's full of himself, uh, he's, he's showing off his kingdom, as it said in verse 8, um, and now he wants to show off his wife, his, his queen, whom I, I believe in those days, you know, his wife was his possession. And so he commands this possession of his, this beautiful queen, to come. But, to her credit, says, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. And so to her credit, she says no. She refused to be gawked at by these men as some coming object common object. And, you know, some feminists use Vashti as being like the first historical feminist. Uh, they hold her up as a hero. Um, some say that Queen Vashti, they kind of mix Queen Vashti with uh, this uh, historical um, queen of Persia named uh, Amestris. And Amestris was someone that the, the uh, historian, the Greek historian Herodotus um, writes about as being the first queen of Persia. And she was the one who uh, delivered Artaxerxes, king, the king's son. So some people assume maybe that Vashti is this actual amestris, and she was pregnant at the time, and she didn't want to come out, or this might be why he didn't kill her, because she was pregnant with his son. Either way, we're, we're not sure. We don't know. But just to let you know, the king 
was famous for his anger of the king. Uh, he was furious. Uh, he was furious at this public insubordination of the queen. He was furious at this public embarrassment. Uh, this is making him look bad in front of his royal court, as well as the people who were there. He was on top of his game, and then his wife tears it all down for him by refusing to come. The king is ticked, and King Xerxes had a bit of a bad temper. On, on, in fact, there's, on one occasion, this actually happened after this event, but on one occasion, history records the same Herodotus, the Greek historian, records that Xerxes was building a bridge to get his army across this river, and a storm came up, and the water destroyed the bridge. And he was so ex uh, angry that he put to death all the head builders because they dared build a bridge that was not strong enough to withstand the storm. And then he sent his army out to punish the water by giving it 60 lashings for daring to oppose his will. That's the anger of King Xerxes. Continuing verse 13, the day, then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this, is what, this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in the law and judgment. Now, throughout Esther and history, you hear the law of the Medes and Persians. When the king made a law, as will happen here, and as Xerxes made regarding the killing of the Jewish people later in the story, and as he had to make another law, allowing the Jewish people to defend themselves, uh, a little uh, spoiler alert there, um, these laws were irrevocable. Uh, there and, and, and there had to be people who could keep track of what laws the different rulers made. So everything from Darius, uh, and actually Cyrus the Great, up to Xerxes, every law the king made had to be kept track of because they couldn't be revoked. So these men were, in a sense, the Supreme Court, in a sense, because they had to keep track of these laws. And so he went to them and said, is there any precedence for this? How do I deal with this? The, and then uh, verse 14, the men next to him, now his rulers are also there, uh, being Karshena, uh, Sethar, Admatha, Tashish, Meriz, Mersana, and Memukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. The, these people saw his face. They were first in the kingdom, meaning they were privileged to be uh to being approaching being able to approach the king uh which makes me think of us we're privileged to approach our king right always because of jesus christ we have the king's ear these people had the king's ear they can always speak to him and in th this sense they they had more access to the king than the queen herself according to the law verse 15 uh, King Xerxes is saying, according to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus that was delivered by the eunuchs. Now, if Xerxes had not been drunk, he would not have commanded Vashti to appear, which he knew was wrong. Uh, and if she had not said no, and he would not have uh, asked for advice and not killed her, and she not be deposed, all these circumstances, all these coincidences or things had to come together to set up Esther. Well, fortunately for, for Queen Vashti, um, the king's drunken rage was still tempered by his understanding of the law of the Pers Persians and Medes. And he knew he, had, he couldn't just fly off and kill his queen. And so he went to these men for advice, these counselors. So continuing the story, verse 16. Then Mimukin said, in the presence of the king and the officials, 
not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women because, I mean, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. So this very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. Or they will learn to read, and they'll start getting ideas, and they'll start thinking, and that Gaston from, from uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast. So you would say this society is a pretty um, man-centered society. Verses 17 and 18, basically they're all afraid that the king, queen's actions will start a woman's liberation movement. That if the queen can get away with this, then every woman is going to rebel against her husband and want equal rights. So he demotes her. She's no longer the queen. And he spreads the word that, there's, that she is through. He announces his intention then that he is going to get a new queen. And that's what's coming up. He's going to get a new queen and he makes it very clear that no one can disobey the king, not even the queen, or she will be deposed and replaced. By the way, chapter two, you see what possibly is a little bit of regret by the king to, of deposing his, his wife. I think he, he has some regret what his drunken stupor caused him to do. Verse 19, if it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all the kingdom, for it is vast, all the women will give honor to her, their husbands, high and low alike. Now there's a chance here that, that in this language, Mimukin has someone in mind already to replace her. Maybe his daughter? I don't know. So verse 21, this advice pleased the king and the princess, and the king did as Mamukin promised. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province and in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master of his, in his household and speak according to the language of his people. Yeah, that's going to work, right? So, honey, you need to do exactly what I say because the king told you, you to. Yeah. It's not a good recipe for a good marriage. As an aside, by the way, it is at this time after this party um, that Xerxes takes his army and attacks Greece. And it's about a two, about a year, a year and a half, two year uh, battle before he comes back and actually chooses Esther. So there's a, a time gap here. Um, what's in, it's interesting that Xerxes attacks Greece, ultimately fails uh, because uh, Greece doesn't come out big. They've basically survived, and, uh, and they remember this time. This is, like I said, this is their Alamo. In fact, a century or so later, a Greek ruler by the name of Alexander the Great will use this very attack as a remember the Alamo rallying cry in order to unite the armies of Greece and march against Persia and destroy Persia and take over the world, which in turn, they implement this Hellenistic, uh, this, what's it called? this campaign to Hellenize 
the known world to make them all speak Greece, uh, Greek, which in turn paves the road for the gospel to spread rapidly when Jesus comes and when the, uh, when the uh, Bible is written in its original, the New Testament is written in its language of Greek. Why is it written in Greek? Because Alexander the Great and the Greeks have, have forced the whole kingdom to learn Greek. So now the whole kingdom knows Greek. And so the, when the gospels get written and start sp being spread around the churches, they can all read it. So you see, this little time starts a domino effect that has, uh, has repercussions for time forever, for eternity. So what are some things that we can think about? In chapter one, Esther portrays the arrogance and temper of the king, which gives us a sense of Esther's fear when she has to approach him, not being called in. She's going kind of against the rules. And then also we see the importance of the law, uh, which helps us to understand the unchangeableness of the law of the Medes and Persians that will later come into effect in our story. Uh, we see Vashti's refusal to appear, which paves the way for Esther's reign. Vashti did not die. Some people think she was still had some influence. Uh, again, the very interesting read. If you go to Tor the Torah, I think it's called Torah.com or something like that. Uh, you have rabbis uh, who are teaching on the Old Testament. Uh, from uh, they're Jewish, the rabbis they're not Christian, but it's strictly they talk about the rabbis of old and what they said here. And you had Babylonian rabbis that said one thing, His, uh, Israelite rabbis who said no, the Israelite rabbis said Vashti was this mistress and that she was an evil, wicked woman, a queen who hated the Jews. Uh, the Israelite. Or Babylon, I don't know, one or the other. Anyway, one of them said that she was had a different view of her. Fascinating read. Look it up. Uh, it's hard to reconcile it all, but we know that God, what he had for us, in, because that's what he has written in Scripture. If he didn't want us to see it, he left it out of Scripture. So now in these days, uh, the... Persian king had a harem. So Queen Vashti and later Queen Esther was not the only wife of the king. They were part of a greater harem. Um, and it's possible that he had two queens. Maybe Queen Vashti was the beautiful queen and Queen Amestris was the ruthless queen. Um, and in fact, there's some talk, I mean, some writing I saw that said that the word Vashti actually comes from the Persian word beautiful. And so it could have been a title, could be, uh, or didn't come directly, but you can see some comparison. So it could be that he was calling for, send me the beautiful queen so I can show her off. So there's all of these what ifs uh, that are fun to, to, to look at, but what we have in scripture what God had, what sees fit for us. So some things to think about. Uh, first of all, if you don't see God's blessing in your life right now, he may be setting you up for a later blessing. At this point in history, I'm sure Queen, uh, the, the future Queen Esther or Mordecai had no idea what was coming their way. They didn't see God's blessing. They just saw a cruel king that they were under uh, and a, 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 a system that did not allow them to worship their God. Only later to be blessed immensely. I think of Joseph who gets thrown into the well by his brothers and then sold into slavery. Um, God was setting things up for him to become 
the second uh, in command of Egypt. And what's he say? He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Uh, when you see evil happening, just remember God is at work setting things up for his good. Um, next thing we can think about is uh, you be careful when you are at the top of your game not to become too boastful because the higher you are, the farther you can fall. We think of king, the king. He was at the top of his game. He had quelled all rebellions. Uh, he had called all his, his army together and they were preparing for what was a sure victory to take over Greece and even make the, the kingdom even bigger. He was on top of his game. And this woman, this queen, who was tr property back then, with one word, knocks the wind out of him. Next, be sure that your advisors are the right people to give you advice. We, uh, the king had advisors who fortunately uh, or unfortunately, you know, uh, was wise enough to go to his advisors and they gave him some crackpot advice. But just you need to have the right advisors, the right counselors, the right friends who are going to speak into your life when you need it. Um, Queen Vashti stood up for what was right. Um, God may be doing something unexpected, as we said, and you, but you, you need to stand up for what is right. Now, with Queen Vashti, she stood up for what is right, which caused her to be pushed aside so Esther could come in. Not quite expected, but God is working. And then lastly, the King of Kings, Christ, that we serve, is infinitely more powerful than the king of kings, Ahasuerus. He's also infinitely more gracious. I think of myself. I put myself in, in, in uh, well, I think of myself. And when I violate my king of kings laws and rules, he doesn't kick me out of his kingdom. He doesn't kill me. Of course, he doesn't ask me to do things that are, undo but i mean uh um the prophet who god called to preach and he ran away uh jonah <laughs> jonah uh he said no to god but god still used him and blessed him and encouraged him and even though even in our stubbornness and our willfulness and our sinfulness god still uses us and blesses us. Esther, um, this setup in chapter one is a setup for the rest of the story. The king's anger, the unchangeableness of the law, the royal vacancy, and the king's reliance on his advisors as like King ha I mean, the Haman comes in who's an advisor to the king. You see how important that relationship is. The attitude, the characters, and the setting, the setting is for this is magnificent, 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 magnificent. <laughs> showing that God is oh, always yeah. <laughs> working. God is always working. Even in this case, through the arrogance of a drunken king. Now, those those focus points, those are from my, the leadership guide that I put out for, the, for small groups, for the breakout groups. Um, breakout groups, and I might be stealing some of Scott's thunder here, but great breakout groups are a great time to get together, to pray, to go further in the, the study, the study uh, to discuss it more, to apply it more, to even maybe you know, look up some videos of of this time because you're interested in it. It's a great time to get together. And I would highly encourage you to find a time to physically come together, not just on Zoom, although if you can't physically, make sure you also get up on Zoom just to be able to connect. Um, 
Let me pray. Father, thank you for this book of Esther. Thank you for uh, the, the connectedness, the, being able to see your hand in history and where the specific play, things in the Bible fit in the greater picture. Pray, Lord, that we would be mindful of the coincidences and unique things that happen in our life and be able to give you glory that you're working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.